Hey everyone, today we are excited to share with you a little snippet of this month's Marketing Moms Monthly, and this is our Q&A section where we answer questions from our community and other places and just sort of help people out, and this is always one of our favorite little sections of the episode, so we can't wait to share it with you. Balancing building a successful business and being a superstar mom is hard, and yet in today's digital world, it's more common than ever. The question becomes, how do we successfully grow a business and children at the same time? Join us for a candid conversation as we share our insights into marketing and motherhood. I'm Angela Reeder. And I'm Jessie Valle. Welcome to the Marketing Moms Podcast. Hey all, Jessie here. So I'm here editing this episode and I wanted to interject and say that we answered 10 Q&A questions and it went an entire hour. So this podcast is typically not that long of episodes, so I'm actually going to cut down on the questions that we share here, but if you're interested in this full section, and of course the full private podcast episode, be sure to check out Marketing Moms Monthly at uh, marketingmomsmonthly.com. But anyway, I really hope you enjoy this. Entrepreneurship questions, momming questions, entrepreneurship while momming questions, all the things. It was really, really fun, and we hope you enjoy. Okay, Angela, number one, what do you do with clients who want meetings all the time? Okay, so I actually get these a lot uh, because my clients tend to be a little older, and you know, when you're doing something bigger like building a website, they, people want to be a little more hands-on. So what I do typically going into things is I set up the expectation that they can have X number of calls per whatever time. So one call a week, one call every other week, one call a month type thing. I give them my scheduler and my scheduler has blocked out specific times that I take calls. Like I only take calls on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from Mm -hmm. this time to this time. So that's already in the scheduler when they go to schedule they're already limited to those times that i've set uh, and they're allowed however many calls a lot of this has to do with boundaries and nobody likes hearing that word (laughs) nobody likes setting boundaries nobody likes holding boundaries nobody likes when other people's boundaries get in their way but at the end of the day when it comes to you know really dealing with the I want to talk about it all the times boundaries is are going to be key okay so do you set those boundaries up ahead of time and what happens if you don't uh well if you don't then it involves a lot of awkward conversations and you have to really kind of enforce those boundaries I do I did not used to I will say I did not used to set those boundaries ahead of time But I have discovered that setting them ahead of time makes things a heck of a lot easier. So yes, when I bring on a client, I give them a little welcome packet. And part of that packet is here's my normal business hours. If you are a retainer client, you can schedule this number of calls with me. If we are doing a website build, you can schedule this number of calls with me per whatever. Here's my scheduler link. Here are the days that I take calls. Now that's not to say that I haven't ever bent that if I do have a client that like really needs a call right away or those days don't work. I am accommodating as much as I can, but having those boundaries set in place eliminates so much back and forth. And I do say that too, when I give people my scheduler link, if they reach out to me for a call Um, I have like an email template and part of that template is basically like, I know it sounds a little impersonal, but this saves a ton of time and back and forth. Yeah. Okay. I like it. Okay. So let's follow up a bit with kind of like a momming side. (laughs) Yes. So here's the other thing about, you know, the Q and A's like, I love that we tackle both the momming and the business because that is our life. It's both. (laughs) Okay. So so following up, like, what do you do? Not just with a client that wants meetings all the time, but how do you deal with extended family, namely like grandparents, 
that feel like they need one-to-one time with your kids each week and that you need to set that up? Ooh. Um, well, there's a couple options. One could be just to have a standing play date. Like every Wednesday you can have the kids, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and that makes it easier for you because you can sort of plan your week and your work around not having the kids that specific day. It Mm -hmm. makes it a little easier for them to plan. So you can kind of spin it like that. Like if we just know you have the kids every Wednesday or Thursday or whatever, then, you know, you can do whatever. Um, So that would be my kind of first recommendation is just to kind of um, front load that planning, (laughs) then get it out of the way. Um, but if it's something where your schedules change every week, different things like that, I would definitely try to have that conversation and say, like, if you want the kids, you're going to have to let me know what works for you because I can't read your mind. I don't know your schedule. And, you know, I have a lot on my plate and, you know, it doesn't matter if you have one kid or six kids, like you have a lot on your plate if you're a mom especially if you're mom running business. Like I have a lot on my plate. I, you know, my schedule runs tight and I'm going to need your help with this if this is something you want. Yeah. I I like that idea of working together versus against each other, Mm -hmm. right? Like being like, we're in this together. Let's make it happen because it's what we both want, which is my kids to be able to spend time with their extended family. Um. But it doesn't have to be weekly, you know? It could also be like right. bi-weekly, like every other sure. Friday or or every other Wednesday afternoon, right? Like if yeah. you set the boundaries not just of the day, but the amount of time. Mm-hmm. I think that I think that it, it's kind of like when you explained the whole um slushy day every month. Yes. <laughs> Your kids know it's coming, they can look forward to it, and then they're not pestering you the rest of the time. And I think yes. it might be – so this question that came from someone, I feel like they are feeling a little resentful because mm-hmm. it's just popping up over and over and over and over. But yeah. if you have that plan, then grandma or whoever will know and look forward to that one day because she knows she hasn't instead of like, when can I take your kids? When can I take your kids? When can, I, I, when can I have the kids? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, communication is really big for that. And it, it's hard. It's hard to have those conversations. It's hard to have conversations with clients. It's hard to have conversations with extended family. Mm-hmm. It's not to say that it's easy or that there's like a magic solution. But in my experience, it is so much easier to have those conversations up front mm-hmm. and to set those expectations and to be very clear that like, I'm not trying to keep you from seeing your kids. Like, I'm trying to work with you so that you can have the grandkids Mm -hmm. as much as you want or as much as we can fit in our schedule or however you want to phrase it. Right. And in a way that that works for you and for us and for them, because when you have kids, whatever age they are, the older kids are a little better, but little kids, they like looking forward to going to grandparents house, Mm -hmm. but they're not always quite so great about surprise. You're going to grandma's house. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like you can tell them yeah. a day or two before they can get excited about it. But if you just wake them up from nap and be like, we're going to grandma's like that can be a little disconcerting for some kids. So I would try to definitely try to spin it in. We're working on this together to do what we can so that everybody gets what they want type thing. Yeah. I like it. All right. Number two. I don't currently have a product. I'm not a coach. I don't have a course. Have I put the cart before the horse? Is affiliate marketing my immediate future? So this is coming from someone who has started to purchase programs that can help them build their business. Mm -hmm. But they're over here like, wait a minute, should I have not done that because I don't actually have anything to sell? Is affiliate marketing my only option? And one of my things is like, why ask this question if you were okay with affiliate marketing? Yeah. Yeah. I think that sort of indicates that maybe that's not the route they want to take. Exactly. 
So it's kind of like, is this the only thing I can do? And if we go down that route, the answer is no. I would venture to say that even if you don't have a product, you're not a coach, you don't have a course, it's okay. You don't have to have a big website or like Mm -hmm. all you have to do is have to have a way to take money. And that could be as simple as having a PayPal account and giving them a pay me link. Yeah. Like if that's how you have to start, that's how you have to start. It's totally fine. Yeah. And, and if you're over here like, well, I don't know what to sell. I don't know who to sell to. Just start solving problems that you know how to solve. It's like and it's like saying you can't be a tech VA if you only know like a little bit of tech. Right. That's okay. You can yeah. help them with the tech that you know how to do and then continue learning and build it up. No one's no one's perfect, but as long as you know how to solve the problem and you know more than the person you're helping, that's enough. Yeah. And be open, be willing to explore options, especially if you are, if you've already invested in programs to help Mm -hmm. you build a business, you clearly, this is something you want to do. Yep. Right. Um, So maybe, so maybe, yeah, maybe you put the cart before the horse a little bit Mm -hmm. by getting programs to help you build a business you don't have. That's fine. They're still going to be there. Most of those programs have at least a certain amount of access you know you get access for they say yeah, lifetime, like a free trial you know, or something whatever yeah. um so most of those have that you can get started and then you can go to those programs and you can use them to build mm-hmm. so it's not a complete and take it from someone who has spent a decade collecting programs i hopped into my teach bull account the other day and i didn't remember why i was in some of the schools that showed up i was like do i have a <laughs> Did I buy something? Did I get something free from there? Or did I buy something? What? So, Or did you help them as a client? <laughs> right? Or were they a client? Yes, exactly. Like So, so you're in good company to start with. Mm-hmm. Secondly, be open to exploring options. Like Jesse said, if you are wanting to be a tech VA and you only know a little tech, help with what you can help with. And then pay attention to what you enjoy. Pay attention to the types of clients you enjoy or the services that you like to provide. Um, If you like making, if you discover, I really like making PDFs, you can make a business out of making and selling PDFs. Mm -hmm. I've seen people do it. Mm -hmm. And it's, (laughs) I know I've talked a little bit about previously my kind of winding journey to (laughs) building websites, but I started out drop shipping. Mm -hmm. I ran a drop shipping business. I still have the, the business for it. I just keep it open because like I ran a dropshipping business and then I did affiliate marketing and then I did blogging, which went along with the affiliate affiliate marketing, which to go to that, if you're going to do affiliate marketing, you're going to need a lot of followers quickly. Mm -hmm. So if a lot of visibility and yeah, if social media visibility and blogging are not your thing, then that's probably not the best route for you to take. Well, Um, and that's the other thing is like, people are like, Oh, is affiliate marketing all I can do? Well, this is, that's the thing. It's like affiliate marketing is also marketing and it's also a lot of work. So if you're going to put a lot of work into something, let's make sure it's the business you want. And if you don't want an affiliate marketing business, then put your time and energy into a business you do want. Yes, exactly. And the affiliate marketing and and all of that is actually how I discovered VA work because I liked putting together the social media posts and putting them out there better than I liked actually doing the affiliate marketing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then I realized there were marketers that didn't like doing social media stuff and that I they would pay me to do that, which I thought was just absolutely fantastic. Exactly. So it's, you know, if you pay attention to the things you enjoy as you're trying things, as you're helping people, it can really help influence which way your business is going to go and help you find something that you enjoy, that you're good at, that people will pay you for. And then you can use all those, the programs and stuff that you have to help you build that business. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go back to another momming question. Does anyone have tips for kiddos who don't want to wake up or get ready in the morning? Their kid is age five. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> I Well, I'm laughing because 
Um, I have I have one kid that will wake herself up to an alarm every day. Like we went mm-hmm. through school. She doesn't sleep. She she's just not a sleeper. She's one of those people that only needs like four hours of sleep a night. So she goes to bed late. But she would wake up every morning, six AM, so that she could watch YouTube before she had to start getting ready for school. Rain or shine, the alarm went off, she was up. I have one kid. She'll get up. It's okay. Like, yeah, all right. I'm not really happy about it, but I'm up. Sometimes you have to go under. But I have another kid that you have to wake up like four times before she will get out of bed. (laughs) So my first tip for this is plan for that. If you Mm -hmm. have to go wake your kid up like four or five times to get them up, just start waking them up early. It sounds counterintuitive because you're like, if they're not waking up at seven, they're sure the heck not going to get up at 630, right? Mm -hmm. But if you can start at 630, you can probably have them out of bed by seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing is, and I've realized, I've always known about myself that I don't like to be rushed. And I'm actually seeing that in my daughter now too. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's like if it stinks to get up a little bit earlier, but that means we're not going to be pressured and rushed, maybe that's why the kid doesn't want to get up is because once they do get up, it's hurry, eat your breakfast, hurry, get dressed, hurry, brush your teeth, hurry, put your shoes on, hurry, let's get out the door. So that's that's really um, anxiety inducing. Yeah. And so the question becomes then, if that's how your kid is, how can we reduce the anxiety that comes along with waking up in the morning. Maybe the kid needs a different routine than you do. And that's the thing is like your kids are not exactly like you. So you have to find out what works best for them. So why don't you just talk to them? I understand they're five, but they can still have an opinion. Hey, you know what? In a perfect world, the moment you woke up in the morning, what would be your perfect morning routine? Like what would be your perfect thing? And maybe their thing is, well, I could get up and I could watch YouTube and then I could eat breakfast. And then, you know, and then it's like, okay, well, great. Why don't we try this where we're going to wake up a little early, but you get to get up and watch YouTube for 10 minutes before we start getting ready. Yeah. But it means you have to get up. Right. And you know what? Maybe that's going to get them out of bed. Maybe that's going to be like, yes, I get YouTube time instead of I'm right. going immediately into eat your breakfast, get dressed, brush your teeth. Yes. Like, exactly. So to I me, have, it's like talk to your kids. I have a friend who has a child who's older now but has done this since they were like three. They have mm-hmm. to eat first thing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like she would take like a granola bar to them in their bed to get them out of bed. Like they had to have something in their belly before they could even make themselves get out of bed, which is Hmm. not something you necessarily think about. But you know, if, if that's what it takes to get your kid out of bed, like if you take your kid a granola bar or a baggie of dry cereal and let them munch on it for a few minutes before they get up and then they can go have breakfast. Like why not? (laughs) Yeah. There's no, nothing that says you have to do it a certain way. Yeah. And I think we forget that as moms sometimes. We get in this, and part of it is a lot of us had the same routine waking up when we were kids and you know, wake up, mm-hmm. get breakfast, brush your teeth, get dressed. And so we kind of have this idea that that's the way you have to do it. Mm-hmm. But there's no rules when it comes to being a mom. Like aside from keep your kid alive, there's not a lot of boundaries there. If you want to give your kid breakfast in bed every day, Give your kid breakfast in bed every day. If you want to bribe them with 10 minutes of YouTube, bribe them with 10 minutes of YouTube. If it makes them happy and you happy and makes the morning go smoothly, why not? Yeah. Okay, next. Because I realized we're only on number three of 10 questions and we're already almost 20 minutes in. Not that it matters. We can make this as long as we want. Right. But I just think it's so funny. (laughs) Okay. Uh, How do you warm up an email list of 10,000 contacts you haven't mailed in a while while simultaneously changing the domain you're sending from? Now, this is a very techie question, but we are techie people, so we can handle it. (laughs) Yeah. My first thing is, okay, so you're trying to do two things. You're trying to warm up an email list of a lot of people that you haven't mailed in a while, and you're trying to change where you're sending from. The domain is like the whatever.com. Yeah. Right. So 
one of my first, well, a couple things. One, you need a re-engagement campaign. Yep. So that's going to be three to five emails at least of trying to warm them back up, get let them get to know you again. Be, don't be pitchy. You're not pitching a single thing in those. No. This is no, just a not hand I've been anything. gone for a while. This and... is purely relationship building yes. and helping. So maybe you can you can recommend resources, you can give mm-hmm. tips, you can be helpful, but this is not about selling whatsoever. This is about, hey, do you still want to be on my list? Yeah. So you need to create that. Then I would say that if you have 10,000 contacts, don't send to all of them at once. No. You need to send to like a thousand of them a day over 10 yeah. days. Yes. And also I I will recommend because I took some – a very big name in the email provider space. I took some training with them. <laughs> <laughs> and what they recommend is run a couple of those little, you know, welcome email things. but. While you're warming up your list, focus on the people who are the most engaged first. So most email programs will let you have a way to check who has Mm -hmm. opened emails in the last 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Start with those people. Start with the people that have opened emails in the last 30 days. Send send an email to them. Send a couple emails to them. Then Mm -hmm. expand it to people who have done in the last 60 days or the last 90 days. That way, you're starting by focusing on the people who are more likely to open your emails. Which and as they your open reputation. your emails, it will, yes, it will help your reputation with the inbox people, the Googles, the Yahoos, mm-hmm. the whatevers, so that yep. you're less likely to end up in spam when you send to those people who haven't opened as many of your things or opened or engaged recently. Yep. That's, that's a really good point. But if you are trying to warm up a list that hasn't been mailed to in like six months, then obviously you have to expand that. But you're right. Like let's still focus on the people who are most likely to engage because Mm -hmm. they're the ones that are going to help your email reputation the best. And by that, I mean you're less likely to end up in spam or be marked as spam. Yeah. Yeah. And Um, and then, well, I was just going to say when you're done, be sure to, purge the emails yes that that didn't that want to respond like there's no point because a lot of email service providers charge you based on how many contacts you have and if yeah. you have 10,000 contacts but only 3,000 of them are actually active get rid of the rest i know it feels counterintuitive yes to, like you're getting rid of all these contacts <laughs> all these potential buyers but guess what right. if they don't open your emails they're never going to buy from you yeah I've had that conversation with clients. I actually did have that happen once. I ran an engagement campaign for a client that had over 10,000 people on their list and only Mm -hmm. like 4,000 people had any kind of engagement at all, even just opening the email. Mm -hmm. And they were absolutely terrified to cut 60% of their, they were like, that's over half my list. Mm -hmm. I can't sell if like, if I don't have 10,000 people, how am I supposed to sell? Like, well, 6,000 of them weren't even opening your emails anyway. Yeah. If they're not opening your emails, all they're doing is clogging things. And not that it matters, but because a lot of people think it does. If you take out all of those people that aren't opening your emails, your open rate is going to (laughs) skyrocket. Which is going to help your reputation and it's going to help you not end up in spam. (laughs) It helps you not end up in spam. Um, So, and I know a lot of people use, um, you know, open rates as like an indicator of how good your emails are or Mm -hmm. how good subject lines are, which doesn't, I'm not a marketer, so that doesn't make sense to me. But from a tech standpoint, it will up your open rate and it Mm -hmm. will make it less likely that you end up in spam. So definitely purge and make that a regular thing. Mm -hmm. Make it like an every three months thing. If somebody hasn't opened your email in three months, just have a little automation that they get dropped into that just says, Hey, I noticed you haven't opened emails in a while. If you don't want to hear from me, click here. If I don't, or if you do want to hear from me, click here. And if I don't hear back from you, we'll take you off the list. And then if they don't open or they don't click, 
two or three emails in a row, then just take them off your list because they clearly don't want to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. I mean, we could talk forever on just email deliverability. Uh, yeah. In fact, did we already do it? Did we do an episode on that once on the podcast? I, don't remember. I think we talked about it, but I don't know if we did one. I don't know. We'll have to look back. Yeah. I mean, we, after we after over a hundred episodes, it's hard to remember what we've done. <laughs> yeah. I'll say if we haven't, we should because there's definitely yeah. there's a lot I'm, there. I actually, I know I have a list somewhere of email deliverability things, but anyway. Okay, I paused for a minute because obviously we're also recording this for you all on our podcast to listen to the the Q&A. And I just wanted to quickly say that if these types of questions are things that you've had on your mind and you want direct access to me and Angela and our community of other moms of businesses, marketing moms, please sign up for Marketing Moms Monthly. You can get a free month over at marketingmomsmonthly.com where you get this private, this full private podcast episode that's usually at least two hours a month. Future Jesse interjecting to say, let's not forget the other half hour worth of Q&A questions on momming and entrepreneurship. And then you also get access to our Discord community where we chat about momming and business and all the things in between together all day long, every day. So you can have access to us in between instead of just our weekly podcast episodes. Um, And then a a, a few other free goodies. So if this is something that interests you, marketingmomsmonthly.com. We would love to see you there. Thank you for joining us today. We're so honored this is where you chose to spend your time. If this episode helped you in some way, please share it with another mom who needs to hear it. We're in this together. And if you're ready for next steps, free goodies, and more, head over to marketingmomspodcast.com. We'll see you next week.